And this is chapter 7.4, estimating the population proportion with confidence intervals. So imagine a large population of people, such as 100 million registered voters in the U.S. Let's assume that 50% of them will vote for the Democratic candidate in the next presidential election. Suppose ABC News takes a simple random sample of 100 registered voters and asks them which candidate they are going to vote for in the next presidential election. So keep in mind that this is our sample size, so lowercase n is 100. And since we're assuming the population has 50% that are going to vote for the Democratic candidate, this is P. So P is 50%. Okay, so can we use a central limit theorem to create the sampling distribution for P hat? Just a proportion of people that will vote for the Democratic candidate and a random sample of 100 registered voters. So we need to check the three conditions for the central limit theorem. And these are the same from the previous section. First one is that condition number one, the sample is collected randomly from the population and observations are independent of each other. Sample can be collected with or without replacement. Notice up here they tell us that they're simple random samples. So we can assume that condition one has been met. Okay, condition two, the sample size n is large enough that the sample expects at least 10 successes and 10 failures. So our sample size is 100. P is 0.5 or 50%. So that first condition, that first part of the sample size condition has been met. And our sample size times 1 minus our proportion of the population that would vote Democratic also gives us a number greater than or equal to 10. So we can say that condition number two has been met. Then condition number three, the sample is collected without replacement, and that is what simple random samples of above tells us. Then the population size n must be at least 10 times bigger than the sample size. So we need to see if 100 million, yeah, 100 million is greater than or equal to 10 times our sample size, 10 times 100 in this case. So we can say yes, that condition has been met. So since these conditions have all been met, we can use the central limit theorem to create the sampling distribution for p hat. So we're going to draw the normal model for the sampling distribution below. So this distribution is going to tell us what our sample proportions look like, what size to expect, how spread out they tend to be. So our horizontal axis is labeled with sample proportions. Now it's going to have a normal shape because all those conditions have been met. Now the center is going to be at 0.5. And then the standard error should be p times 1 minus p over n, which gives us 0.05 for the standard error. So now we can put a few more numbers on our axes down here and get a sense of how spread out our sample results will likely be. So this is p plus 1 standard error, plus 2 standard errors, and plus 3. And if I subtract the standard error, subtract 2 of them, Subtract three of them and go down to the left hand side. So I now have an idea of what my sample proportions are going to look like. So, according to the sampling distribution, what percentage of the sample should we expect to express as support for the Democratic candidate? We expect about 50% or 0.5 to express support for the Democratic candidate, give or take a little bit, so plus or minus about 5%. We could also do this in percent form, around 50%, give or take about 5%. So 45 to 55%, that's what we expect. So it's a probability that the sample proportion will fall within two standard errors of the population proportion, which is p hat. So two standard errors below, two standard errors above. So looking at all of these sample results in between those two values, and according to our empirical rule, that should be about 95% of our sample results. Or 95% of our p hats should fall within two standard errors of the population proportion. Okay, our conclusion that we should expect our sample proportion to be 50%, give or take 5 percentage points, is useful because it implies that in general we can predict where p hat will fall relative to p. It indicates that p hat is very likely to fall within two standard errors of the true value of p, as long as the sample size is large enough. If we have a small standard error, then we know that p hat is quite likely to fall close to p. If we can predict that p hat will fall close to p, then we can also predict that p will be close to our sample proportion, p hat. So let's return to the more realistic situation of not knowing the value of p, not knowing the population proportion.
Right? So a simple random sample of 1,200 Americans, age 20 and over, contained 138 diabetics. In this case, we have access to the sample data, but not the entire population. This means we can calculate p hat, but not p. So what is p hat? Well, that's the proportion of our sample that said they were diabetic. So we have 138 diabetics out of 1,200. And this gives us 11.5%, or in decimal form, 0.115. Right, so again, p hat is the proportion of the sample that are diabetic. So is this estimate unbiased? You can say yes. Sampling method was unbiased. Because they told us that they did simple random samples, or a simple random sample. Right, so estimate the standard error. So notice we've got EST here for estimate, and we're replacing P with P hat, because we don't know the actual proportion of the population that are diabetic. So we're going to calculate this with 0.115 times 1 minus 0.115 over our sample size of 1,200. So our estimated standard error is 0.0092. Okay, so what does this estimated standard error tell us? Well, it gives us an idea of how spread out the p-hats are likely to be. So it gives us a typical distance from p. Okay, so what do we know about the sampling distribution for p-hat? Uh, the three conditions for the central limit theorem is satisfied. So we were told that they were simple random samples. So that means we can assume that they're random samples and independent observations. Independent observation means each person was chosen independently of all the other people in the sample. And we can check to see if the sample size is big enough. So we're going to do n times p hat, because we don't have p, and see if that's greater than or equal to 10. And we need to check if n times 1 minus p hat is also bigger than or equal to 10. So in this case, we've got 1,200 for our sample size times 0.115. And that's going to be larger than 10. In fact, it's going to give us 138. And here we've got 1,200 times 1 minus 0.115 which gives us an answer of 1,062. And then our third condition, we did this without replacements. So we need to make sure our population size is at least 10 times our sample. So if we're thinking about our population being Americans or American adults, we probably have more than 10 times 1,200 or 12,000 people in our population. So we can say all three of these have been met. And so what do we know about the sampling distribution then? We now know that the sampling distribution is distributed normally, has a center at point, or a center at P. We don't actually know the center right now. And has a standard error close to, if not the same as 0 0.0092. But this is the question mark. We don't know where it's centered. What does the sampling distribution for p hat look like? Well, we know the shape. That's that capital N. We know the spread. And we don't know where it's centered. So we're going to have a harder time putting numbers on here. We can say that this first mark is going to be p plus a standard error. And this last mark is p plus three standard errors. And I'm skipping the middle one just because there's not enough room there. Over here on the left, same thing. This last mark should be p minus 3 standard errors. And this should be p minus 1 standard error. So these are all sample proportions. Not, not quite enough room there. So let me remind you here, your axes contains possible values for sample proportions, or p hats. Okay. Again, the big question mark, we don't know what p is. So what else can we conclude? Well, we can be highly confident that the population parameter p is between these two numbers. So we can take p hat minus 3 standard errors and go all the way up to p hat plus 3 standard errors. So the p hat was 
And if we do three times our standard error, and our standard error was 0 0.0092, or putting that in percent form, we get 2.76%. So I'm going to encourage you to double check that on your calculator. And if I complete that subtraction, and the addition over here, p hat plus three standard errors, I can be highly confident that the population parameters somewhere between 8.74% and 14.26%. Okay, this is an example of a confidence interval. This confidence interval could also be reported in the following form. So we take our, our sample result, 11.5%, and we combine the addition and subtraction statements we did up here. So that's this symbol right here. That's plus or minus. And then we've got our standard error here, three standard errors. So we read that as 11.5% plus or minus 2.76%. So confidence intervals report the sample proportion plus or minus some amount. The sum amount is called the margin of error, which tells us how far from the population value our estimate is likely to be. Confidence intervals provide two pieces of information, a range of plausible values for a population parameter P, a confidence level, which expresses our level of confidence in this interval, and they are calculated as follows. We take our sample result, our sample proportion P hat, and at give or take a margin of error, add and subtract a margin of error. A margin of error is another way of saying a couple of standard errors. And we select a margin of error based on our desired confidence level. The following diagram shows four different margins of error for a sample in which p hat is 11.5% and the standard error is 0.92%. So this is the same as what we had in our diabetic example. So here's our p hat. And if we want to be 68% confident, we just use one standard error. In our example, we went out three standard errors. We said p hat is give or take three standard errors. We're confident that this population proportion is somewhere between 8.74% and 14.26%. Okay, let's consider what is meant by a range of plausible values for a population parameter p. By taking another look at our simple random sample of 1,200 Americans, age 20 and over, in which 138 people were diabetics. So a reminder, in this case we have access to the sample data and we were able to calculate p hat, which is 11.5%, and this again came from taking 138 out of 1,200 people, but we don't know the population proportion p. So which of the following sampling distributions for p hat, the proportion of diabetics in a sample of 1,200, could have produced a p hat value of 11.5%. Well, what if p is 9.5%? That's this first distribution here. I'm going to relabel this as p hat. If that were the case, if the proportion of people in the population that had diabetes was 9.5%, then our sample result, 11.5%, is somewhere in here. And that's a little bit far out to think that that's a plausible value. That's in the questionable range. But if our P is 10%, that's this number right here, and again, I'm going to relabel that as P hat, then a sample result of 11.5%, that's a little bit more plausible. That looks like that sampling distribution could have given us a sample result of 11.5%. So maybe we'll put an X here and say that one's not as likely. This one, that could be. That's, that's likely. Here, what if P were 10.5%? Could we have seen a sample result of 11.5%? Well, here's our p hat, 11.5%. That's getting closer towards the middle, so I think that's a plausible explanation. That's a plausible value of p. And if we keep going through these in a similar fashion, we're going to see that a lot of these would work. p could be 11%, in which case our sample result of 11.5% is certainly very close to the middle of that distribution, something that's very likely to happen. Here, if P is 11.5%, well then yes, we could definitely get a sample result of 11.5%. It's right in the middle of the distribution. If we get a population proportion, or if the proportion of the population with diabetes is 
Well, our sample result isn't all that unlikely. It could happen very often. Here's 11 and percent. So I'm going to check this one off. In fact, I'm going to check all three of these off. It's very likely that if P were any one of those three values, then our sample result would be likely to happen. All right, so down here, let's check these last three. So I'm going to relabel these horizontal axes with P hat. Just to remind you that these are possible values of your sample proportion if, in this case, P is 12.5%. So in that case, here's a sample result of 11.5. Clean that up just a little bit. And that, if this were the case, 12.5% of the population were diabetic, then we could certainly get a sample result of 11.5%. Here, if population proportion is 13%, 11 and a half, not too far away again. This is still a plausible value, a plausible scenario. And then here, last one, if P is 13 and a half percent, you start getting into that questionable range where a sample result of 11.5 percent starting to get too far away, and we might cast some suspicion on that. And we might rule that one out and say, no, nope, we don't think that's a plausible value of P. But these two, those could be possible values for P. So last question down on the bottom of this page, are these the only sampling distributions that our P hat could have come from? We have to say no, they're not the only ones. We could say any P between the ones given above would also work. So any value of P between the ones given above would also work. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a closer look. Right, so I'm going to take this as my example. So if we say 12.5% is a likely value of P and 13% is a likely value of P, then the statement down here that any value of P between the ones given would also work means something like 12.6% is also a possible value of P or 12.659% also works. So we're not just limiting our attention to the ones given, but anything in between them is also possible or plausible. Okay, confidence interval provides a range of plausible values for a population parameter P. This means that all of the values in the interval, not just the endpoints, are plausible values of P. It also means that our sample result, P hat, is a plausible result given a sampling distribution for any value of P within our confidence interval. So let's return to our first scenario where P was known so that we can get a better sense of what the confidence level means. Following is a normal model for the sampling distribution for P hat, proportion of people that will vote for the Democratic candidate in a random sample of 100 registered voters. In this one, we were assuming that the proportion of the population that voted will vote for the Democratic candidate is 50%. So notice that's in the center of our distribution here. And again, this distribution is giving you possible values for your sample proportion if you take a random sample of 100 voters. So again, 0.5 is in the middle. Standard error. We calculated this before. Let me just put this back up here as a reminder. We found that that was 0.05. So that's where these other numbers on our axes came from. All right, so in A, one student decides to take a random sample of 100 registered voters and finds P hat equal to 45%. So 45% of this student's sample so they would vote for the Democratic candidate. This student then calculates a confidence interval using two standard errors. Will this interval capture P? Let's take this person's P hat, 0.45, and add and subtract two standard errors. Remember, our standard error is 0.05. This means we're going to take 0.45 plus or minus 0.1. And that's going to give us an interval that goes from 0.35 up to and including 0.55. So if you go back up to our graph, here's that student's sample result. Two standard errors to the left would be right here. Two standard errors to the right would be right here. And notice that P is inside that interval. So we can say yes, this interval does capture P. Here's another example in Part B. Another student decides to take a random sample of 100 registered voters, just like the first student. 
and in this case finds a p hat of 38 percent. So this student also calculates a confidence interval using two standard errors. Will this interval capture p? So let's take this student's result of 0.38 and add and subtract two standard errors. Remember two standard errors is the same or equal to 0.1. So this gives this student a confidence interval from 0.28 up to and including 0.48. Right, so if we look at the distribution up above, here's this student's p hat. Here's the 0.38. Two standard errors to the left, roughly down here. Two standard errors to the right, right about here. Notice that that interval does not include the 0.5. It doesn't extend far enough to the right to be successful. So we have to say no for the second student. It does not capture P. So the question of, of interest to us then is what proportion of the P hats in the sampling distribution will produce a successful confidence interval if we use two standard errors? And what proportion won't work? Well, anything between here and here, if we go two standard errors to either side, this would work. All of these p hats, and you remember these numbers on the horizontal axis are all sample proportions. All of these would work. In other words, 95% of the p hats would produce a successful interval. So if 95 work, that means the other p hats, the ones in the tails, are not going to work. They're too far away to work. So just again, another reminder, these are sample proportions or possible values of your sample proportion. They're all p hats. So these, again, are so far away. These 5% won't work. If you build an interval using these values of p hat, you're not going to have a successful interval. All right, so the confidence level tells us how often the estimation method is successful. Our method is to take a random sample, calculate p hat, and then calculate a confidence interval to estimate the population proportion. And the population proportion is p. So if the method has a 100% confidence level, then the method always works. If the method has a 95% confidence level, then the method works 95% of the time, or for 95% of the sample proportions. The method has a 10% confidence level, then the method works in only 10% of the surveys. So we say the method works if the interval captures the true value of the population parameter. In other words, the interval works if the true population proportion is inside the interval. Keep in mind that the population proportion does not move. It is always the same. However, the confidence interval does change with every random sample collected. Thus, the confidence level measures the success rate of the method, not of any one particular interval. So how do we choose a level of confidence? Let's take another look at the diagram illustrating the four different confidence levels that we saw earlier. Right, so notice that if we increase the margin of error from two standard errors, so here's two standard errors, and we go up to three standard errors, it's a little bit wider. We gain only a small amount of confidence. We go from 95% confidence to 99.7% confidence. If we go the other direction, if we decrease the margin of error from two standard errors to one, that's here and here, those are one standard error above the p hat, the sample result they got, we lose a lot of confidence. The confidence level falls from 95% to 68%. So the most common level of confidence used is usually 95%. Others can also be used. In fact, the following table summarizes the margin of error for four commonly used confidence levels. So if you want to use a confidence level of 80%, then you need to go 2.58 standard errors to either side of your sample results. And there's a small typo here. This hopefully will be fixed in your packets. And this should be reversed. This should be the 99% confidence level, 95%, 90%, and 80%. Right, so if you want to be 99% confident, 
Notice that you have to go about 2.58 standard errors to either side of p hat. 95%, the one we use, notice isn't two standard errors. The more exact value is 1.96 standard errors. So two comes from the empirical rule. It's just a rounded value. Okay. 90% to use 1.645 standard errors, and 80% is 1.28 standard errors. All right, so the formula for confidence interval is p hat plus or minus your margin of error, so m is the margin of error. We can also write that as p hat plus or minus z star times your estimated standard error. So z star is a multiplier that is chosen to achieve the desired confidence level, and it's sometimes referred to as a critical value. And we can expand upon the standard error, the estimated standard error, with the formula we used before. And that's the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat over n. So a couple other notes. Again, m is the margin of error. Second thing here, p hat is your sample proportion, or sample proportion of successes, or the proportion of people in the sample with the characteristic we are interested in. n, lowercase n, is your sample size. Z star is a multiplier again. It's chosen to achieve the desired confidence level. It's sometimes referred to as a critical value. And we usually read that as Z star. Okay. The bigger that number is, the more standard errors you're using, the wider your, level, your confidence interval is going to be, which means you're going to have an increased confidence level. And SE, standard error, with EST, this means it's an estimated standard error. Okay, as again is your estimated standard error. So remember this formula depends on the central limit theorem conditions being met. So how do we interpret a confidence interval? Let's use a confidence interval we've already calculated. So 99.7% confidence interval for the proportion of diabetics in the population was 8.74% up to and again including 14.2%. 6%. Right. This 99.7% confidence level was because we used three standard errors. Right. So this confidence interval tells us that any value between 8.74% and 14.26%, again including those two values themselves as well, is a plausible value for the percentage of diabetics in the population. So it's a plausible value for P. Any value outside this confidence interval is not a plausible value for the percentage of diabetics in the population. It's not impossible that the population values outside this confidence interval, but it would be very surprising. And we can interpret this confidence interval as follows. We can be 99.7% confident that the percentage of people with diabetes in the population is between 8.74% and 14.26%. So if we were to repeat this survey many times, then in 99.7% of the surveys, the resulting confidence interval would succeed in capturing the, the percentage of diabetes, sorry, the percentage of diabetics in the population. Right, and 16, our confidence is in the process that produces a confidence interval, not in any one particular interval. It's incorrect to say that a, a particular confidence interval has a 95% or any other percent chance of including the true population parameter. Instead, we say that the process that produces the confidence intervals captures the true population parameter with a 95% probability. 